Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for June 11th, 2024. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life that you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before, before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. And we are streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can share questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start by recapping last week's weekly, or the weekly title from two weeks ago, mm -hmm. which was called Your Moving Challenge. The assignment was to take early action to address a specific pr perspective moving roadblock, whether or not you're actively planning your next move now. Let's hear from our participants live in Zoom and on Facebook. Who worked on a moving challenge this week? Please let us know in the comments. YouTube viewer Livmo shared this comment. I love the pre-move prep challenge. I'm going to assess what's in all the kitchen cabinets. It amazes me how often when I ask a client, would you be willing to move this to a new place? The answer is no. <laughs> Using a move as a filter for your belongings is a great way to help you decide whether it's okay to let it go now or not. And if you wouldn't bother moving it, then it really doesn't need to stay in your house now at all. I'll bet there's a lot of stuff that you can head to donation in your kitchen right now. And won't you be amazed at how much more room you have and how much easier it is to put things away. Um, kitchens in particular gather a lot of, gee, that device looks useful. Gee, that pan can still be a pan. <laughs> it encourages, uh, kitchen gear encourages you to keep it because it all lo still looks useful and functional, even if it's not pretty, or even if you have 17 of them. <laughs> and so um, it's, it's usually a very ripe population to filter out for, I'm not moving all this stuff to my new house. I can move a fraction of it and the rest of it can go to donation. And I will be doing that in my kitchen on my move any day now. So <laughs> I'm right there with you. YouTube viewer BB also reported having gotten ahead of this tittle. BB writes, I, I already had thought about this week's tittle. Furniture is the biggest and heaviest thing to move. I did, decided I will keep all my furniture until I can afford to move away from my parents. I only have one piece of furniture that would be worth it to me to move to a new place. For the rest, including my bed, I will leave it at home and my parents can turn my room into a guest room. I can then purchase a new bed and some used or budget furniture at my new place. That is an excellent plan for moving out. Save the money to move the furniture from your parents' house and buy exactly what you need and no more for the new place, wherever that is. You can spread out purchases over time instead of spending a large chunk of money for a move at all at once. And you can gradually purchase used and budget furniture items as you determine what you'd like to fit into the new space. So no extra items to deal with in the new place either. I think it's a really good plan. And it's a good cash flow management plan too, because moving is expensive and you pay a lot of money for those guys to show up and carry all your stuff and move it. And so anything you can do to reduce that expense um, and furniture, you don't have to buy all the furniture you need all at once. And so you can go and buy piece A and then save up for the next one and go buy piece B, like you can do it over time. So um, it is a good uh, cash flow way to manage your move as well. I like it. And I like that you're, you know, here, mom, you can save all this stuff to have the guest room. <laughs> and I don't have to take it all with me when I get out of there. So good job. I think it's a good plan. Connie reports, not a moving challenge, rather a quick sort of clothes to donate to Parish Flea Market. Lots of trying on and five dresses and three blazers gone. Excellent. And I'm sure that the flea market the, the, for the parish is going to appreciate the donations and how great. Now that's a, you know, that's a significant amount of space on your clothing rod to have all that stuff, like those seven or eight pieces out. So good job. And M also has a non tittle report. M says not the tittle, but a struggle I have been enduring in my kitchen, full sink and cluttered counters. 
a friend said as I, I was smart to leave dishes and clean up all at once so I let them go for nine days but then it took more than two days to clean up the mess I then mm. tried the other way cleaning as I go that takes discipline however today marks four weeks of nothing in the sink in the morning and no dishes in the sink for more than a few hours during the day I love the clean kitchen wow the bonus is today I caught myself cleaning up dishes without thinking about it. A new habit has been formed. Hurrah. <laughs> we are totally cheering for you about that. That is awesome. Wow. And I love that you was like, okay, let's, I'm going to try plan A and plan B. And plan A was painful and took me two days to get it done. <laughs> and plan B is so much better. And I have a clean kitchen every day when I come in. Isn't that awesome? Oh, we are also proud of you. That is a great habit. And I'm sure it was a challenge to make the shift, but you've totally done it. And you're the one that's benefiting from that improved habit. You're the one that gets the clean kitchen and gets to look at a clean kitchen when you come in in the morning. I love that so much. Thank you for sharing that. That is awesome. Em added the shift was torture. <laughs> I'm sure it can be hard. It can be hard work cultivating that new habit. Yes, it can. But that's great, though. That's the real the real learning. There is when you, as she said, I caught myself cleaning up dishes without thinking about thinking it. About it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and when you when you when you recognize that that's happened, you should give yourself a great big pat on the back because you have successfully uh, cultivated a habit. That is so fantastic. Awesome. And, and it was and it was painful while you were making the shift, but it was also painful to spend those two days to clean the kitchen after. Uh, you know, waiting a week and a half to deal with anything. I'm sure that was a monumental project that took a huge amount of work and both of them are suffering. They're just suffering in a more concentrated way. <laughs> when you have to spend two full days in the kitchen, that's like a whole different level of suffering to me. That's like really, you know, having to stand in it for that long is painful. Mm -hmm. And this way you're doling out your, you know, pain and suffering in little bits over the day. <laughs> so it's not, it's not as big of a thing, I think. I don't know. I know that it was hard. And I know that you. Um, it, it took a lot of discipline for you to make the effort to shift how you do it and to do and to be conscious of it and then be in there doing it despite the fact that you r would rather resist. So <laughs> we want to recognize that you made a big jump there and worked really hard at it. And your reward is a month later, here you are. And I'm so proud of you. That is really, really amazing. And a good testimonial to the rest of the audience that's watching about yeah you suffered for a month but now you're doing it automatically and you like the results so much better isn't that fabulous you can get there you can make that shift you can have it be different and totally be the beneficiary 100 percent of your own efforts like that to me is everybody forgets that you do the work but you are 100 percent the person that benefits from the work that you do you're not um, you're not benefiting anybody outside the house. You're benefiting you by in your own space by doing this stuff in your own space. You're gifting to you to your future self, and you have totally done that. And I'm super proud of you. Awesome. Well done. All right, let's get on to our main topic. Many of us experience a feedback loop between clutter and negative emotions. We feel bad, so we ignore or exacerbate our clutter, which makes us feel worse. Living with clutter can reinforce unproductive patterns such as self-destruction, resistance, and pain avoidance. Today, we're going to discuss how the decluttering process can help us release bad feelings and work toward a more positive emotional environment. Clutter is a collection of stuff with a lot of baggage. We have all the excess stuff, and we also have all the feelings that go with or come about because of the excess stuff. When, when I do an assessment of someone's home, I might ask them, what do you think contributed to the clutter buildup here? And the answers are always an, an emotional journey. I had a major surgery. I got a divorce. My parents needed full-time care. Managing my kid's schedule was so time-consuming. I started a new job. I travel so much for work. My husband died. The list goes on and on. Clients are telling me what was stressing them out and overwhelming them what made them abandon dealing with the stuff in the house or made them start shopping to soothe their stress. The story is never, I just bought a bunch of stuff. There's much more going on under the surface emotionally when someone loses the battle with clutter in their own space. 
Once they realize that the space has gotten out of their control or past their willingness to recover, then they add more emotional baggage to the story because now they start to feel like failures. They feel stuck and overwhelmed or they feel guilty about it. Clients often report feeling shameful and embarrassed because they're sure that they're the only ones that live in such a mess. When you look around your house and all those emotions start reflecting back at you in your mind, boy, doesn't that make you close your eyes and look away, looking for any distractions so you don't have to see those negative emotions reflecting in your space. We are affected physically by the mess in a negative way. It's hard to move around. It's hard to function in the house because the clutter's in the way. But then the clutter doubles down and affects us emotionally as well. We try not to notice how loud the clutter becomes, but after a point, it becomes a dull roar in our head. Clean me up, you failure as a human. <laughs> I've heard people say all kinds of horrible things about themselves in explanation of the da disaster that I'm standing in. As a result, I spent a lot of time saying, no, it's just how the things are. It's not telling me that you're a bad person or a failure. We all get overwhelmed by situations in life. And dealing with clutter falls to the bottom of everyone's list when your spouse is dying or you've got an illness. The trick is to turn to a plan and start tackling the clutter when you've reached either one, a break in the situation that was holding your attention, or two, a limit to what you can stand to live in. And making that turn into action can start to lift those emotional burdens while you're clearing the physical burden. It happens at the same time. Your actions bring relief to both aspects of the clutter, physical and emotional. I like to talk with clients about reframing your negative thoughts about yourself so you can see the problem of clutter differently and head towards solutions. Instead of listening to all the negative things you tell yourself about why the clutter happened and what the clutter means about who you are, instead make an effort to give yourself some grace. Forgive yourself. Accept the situation for what it is. It's just a project that needs to be tackled. And release all the judgments you think clutter means about you, who you are, and what you're doing here on the planet. You do not have to accept all those judgments. Decluttering can trigger a shift in your life. Processing your clutter can mirror processing your emotional baggage. And in a positive way, it can make change in your life. Processing that clutter can be a much less painful way of facing your issues and finally moving forward. In an obvious way, it will make your living area more pleasant, like the kitchen that is now beautiful when she goes into <laughs> to be there every week, every day. And finally, make your life easier to live. It's, it's all going to help you make it easier to live, but it will help shift your emotional life to a new place too. It will make improvements in your life, both physically and mentally. We like referring to the ideas from the field of positive psychology for ways to create happiness in your life. Proponents of positive psychology suggest practices that can help your brain become more positive and support more happiness. Simple habits that have been shown to make humans happier and more successful. And here's the ideas for habits that we gather from that field of research. Um, one suggestion they make is to write down three things you're grateful about. This activity helps rewire your brain to retain a pattern of scanning the world for the positive instead of the negative. Isn't that a better way to focus? You can also journal about a positive experience. The act of writing it down gives your brain a chance to relive the experience because you're using that kinesthetic process of touching pen to paper and making that physical motion while you're describing a positive experience that you had. What a great way to relive it. Physical exercise is a suggestion as well that helps. The action of regular moderate exercise teaches your brain that behavior matters. And uh, you, uh, aside from all of the mental benefits, emotional ben regulation benefits that come from physical exercise, um, you're going to feel fit physically better, but it also enhances um, how you manage and regulate your emotions. Meditation is another suggestion. The practice of meditation teaches your brain to focus on the moment and the task at hand instead of on many competing tasks and distractions. So sometimes meditation is helpful for you to stay in that moment and focus on what's right in front of you. And uh, lastly, this positive research talk, the 
what's the word I'm trying to look for here? Positive psychology. Thank you. This positive psychology suggests um, you can practice random acts of kindness. So send a supportive, positive email to someone every time you open your inbox, praising or thanking them, uh, thanking anybody in your social network, somebody that you know or work with. Any other kinds of random acts of kindness will work as well. Uh, that email is just a suggestion, but there's um, there's a million ways that you can do small random acts of kindness in the world that will make you feel better about yourself as you're doing them. And all these suggestions struck us as great ideas and ones that were easily adaptable to a clutter project focus. So we created a declutter focused version of the list that we're going to share with you as today's tittle. And so I'm going to run down and give you the tittle right now. Today's, this week's title is called Self-Care for Positive Decluttering Experience, and this week's assignment is to try one or more of our declutter-focused self-care suggestions, and the first one is express your gratitude or positive attitude <laughs> posted on uh, our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or in the comment on our website when you've accomplished a decluttering, uh, clutter-reducing task. So uh, the title report that we got this uh, earlier about how she changed her habit around cleaning up in the kitchen will be a perfect kind of thing. Like let's go express um, your gratitude that you accomplished, that you've uh, added that habit into your life. Other people will be inspired by that. I'm sure that uh, you can journal, take a moment to write in your journal about the experience of letting go of something, or you can call a friend to talk about it. And sometimes you just need somebody to go, Woohoo! You did a great job, right? And recognizing how hard it was for you to let it go, or the process that you went through mentally as you made those decisions, uh, write about that experience and what you got out of it because you finally let it go. Go and talk about it with your friends. I think that's a great way to just reflect on what the experience was like and what you got out of it. As they suggested earlier, you can exercise. So we can do our version, the decluttering version of that, which is set a timer and declutter for 15 minutes a day or try the 10 items exercise where each day you pick up 10 items that need to be thrown away and 10 items that you can donate, 10 items to put back where they belong or any combination thereof. So just set the set that rapid fire short term exercise to declutter 10 things at once whatever direction you need to go, throw away, donate, or put back. Just that little bit of focusing on declutter activity every day will help you move forward and feel better about yourself too. You can meditate. So the, the, clutter, the declutter adapted version of this is to sit in a clutter-free space and focus on how that makes you feel. If your home doesn't really have such a space yet, then go find one out in the world. Go sit in a furniture showroom or a model home or a museum or an art gallery and notice how your mind feels in this environment. Um, the idea is to just focus on how you feel differently when the space is not clamoring for your attention, when the space feels soothing instead. So you can have the experience of the positive experience of being relaxed and relieved in that kind of environment as a reflection of what you're aiming for to have in your own house. <laughs> and then you can focus on a not so random act of kindness, uh, give something away as a donation, and then tell us about it in on YouTube or in Facebook or on our website. Come back and tell us what you gave away. Um, like uh, the title report earlier about it, she went through a closet, tried on a bunch of clothes, gave away eight things to the, uh, to the parish sale. So um, that's a random act of kindness that you can come and tell us about it. Um, the people that end up with those clothes won't ever know that you did it, but it's still, um, you know, a random act of kindness that we want to know about. So come and tell us about it. Try all these for a week, or you can try a few of these, one each day, to see if you can shift your feelings or your energy around your clutter project and shift your resistance to getting into action on the project. Let this be your clutter clearing practice and see how much forward motion you've achieved or can spur into action for yourself. And if it brings up something painful to deal with, then make sure you seek the help you need, either talking to your friends or to professionals to help you process and move past whatever you've been avoiding. And it'll be worth it in the end to deal with that emotion and move on and start getting your declutter project going.
we actually talked before the show started about before and after pictures, which we have not published a lot of uh, on Clutter Fairy resources. And Susie says, if I had a nice clean place after I decluttered, I would put up my before pictures as encouragement to other people. Mm. Unfortunately, the house is still a big mess. <laughs> I wanted to bring bring that up again because I, I'd like to, we talked about this before we started the recording today, and I'd right. love to get comments from our YouTube audience and, and anybody watching or listening about Instagram, should the clutter fairy, the question of the week is, should the clutter fairy be on Instagram? We don't uh, put a lot of stuff on Instagram right now, but it, we'd love to hear from people pro or con Instagram. Rowan said, my solution to quick and easy dishwashing, I only have a very few items, so it only takes 10 minutes max to wash everything that is mine. Housemate puts everything in dishwasher. <clears throat> there you go. That's okay. She she well, has corralled her collection right down to a manageable. That's the definition to me of she made the set equal her willingness and her, the time frame that she wants to spend cleaning. And so her, her set is yeah, small, and her requirements. Right? She decided mm -hmm. what was what was enough for her. What her parameters were right, right, right. Yeah. And as a result, she can spend ten minutes cleaning everything she's got, which is awesome. <clears throat> Susie says, uh, "This is the, the we, there's some." late tittle comments that came in tittle reports so i'm going to share those in here too okay okay susie says i joined a free cycle a week ago and managed to give away a stack of records that someone had wanted i have a bar and stool set listed but i need to add a picture i might just put it in the front yard and hope someone takes it and they probably will if you put it out there and put a free sign on it i will tell you that people generally get nervous if you are standing there when they come and look at it they prefer to look at it um, anonymously and <laughs> and not feel like the owner of the object is watching them so um, i will tell you to put it out there and then go back in the house and then you can watch quietly from inside the house somewhere and see if it gets picked up but um, it is important to not let the people feel intimidated about stopping and grabbing it it's out there and that is the um you know if it's out there that signals I do know I no longer want it I want it to go away so they know it's the international signal for come and take this piece of furniture that obviously belongs inside a house away from me because <laughs> it's on my curb <laughs> so it should go pretty fast as long as there, as long as you have some traffic up and down your street if you are if you are in sort of an isolated part of your neighborhood where there's not a lot of driving like pass by traffic um, then you might want to post a picture that of it on the curb into whatever is your next door neighborhood, yeah. you know, whatever Facebook. your neighborhood board is. Yeah. Facebook mm -hmm. local group or, or something. Yeah. So that people realize that it's there and they can make the trip. Okay. On the topic of negative, negative emotions, the, the, and, and how we, uh, how, how they complicate the clutter issue. Rowan says, my rant is still, you are not your stuff. And you are definitely not the arrangement of your stuff. That is 100% true. I spend so much of my time helping people talk about, I feel bad about this. I feel bad about myself because of this. I have judgments about who I am. I have, um, you know, I believe my housemates who are telling me I'm a failure. I believe my parents who are disappointed in me, like, there's all kinds of, um, you know, my, yeah, my, my spouse with a, mm -hmm. with a different attitude and perspective on how much how, you know, on tolerance for stuff, how much stuff is acceptable. Right. And just talking through the, you don't have to accept that label. This is not, it's not about, it's not about something being wrong with you. It's about whatever got in the way of your ability to keep on top of it and so let's find out what that is let's talk about how we can get around it let's find out where your breaking points are let's find out what your skill set is um what do you have skills around and what do you not like a lot of times people say to me you know my mother our house was always a wreck i didn't learn anything from my parents well yeah you know if you if you're somewhere where they're not modeling the behavior that you want uh, that you need to learn then surprise surprise 
unless you actively seek out another solution, you don't learn it that way. And so it's hardly ever about there's something wrong and broken with you. It's about you don't have the skill set. Uh, you don't have the focus. Like there's other stuff going on in your life. There's things that require your attention. And nobody thinks decluttering is the most fun thing they'd rather be doing at the top of their day. <laughs> hardly anybody picks that as the first thing they want to do. It's not on the list of fun entertainment activities. And so uh, while I enjoy decluttering, it's still a job. <laughs> I still am going to work when I go and do it. And so it's not, it's not any better of an activity for you as a person in your own house. But you can still learn how to get around it. You can learn how to manage it yourself. You can learn what will work for you in your space, in your tolerance level, in your relationships. And there's ways to tackle it and, and we can get there and we just have to get past all of the judgment that you're giving yourself about it. Like that doesn't get us anywhere. Um, those judgments definitely shut people down. So any kind of a, I'm bad and wrong because I can't do this. My spouse thinks I'm a failure. My kids think I'm, you know, a terrible mom fill in the blank all the all the bad things you say to yourself about it my yeah my uh, we've had comments from uh a participant before about um, a neighbor who oh, always right. feels compelled <clears throat> to comment to, to on, the, on the state of <laughs> on the state of the garage yeah you know <laughs> it's like really come on man it's my garage why are you giving me a hard time yeah Linda says it, Oh, Linda says, encouraging positive self-talk about our stuff is so helpful in clearing stuff out. I get to choose how I'm going to respond to my stuff. Yes, exactly. And you can choose to have a better environment and you can choose to learn a new habit and you can choose that you would rather not have your house be yelling at you in your head. I mean, it, it's amazing to me how much negative self-talk people are willing to put up with rather than stopping and going, gee, I'm the one yelling at myself in this situation. I don't like that. I'm not enjoying that. How can I fix that? And so I'm here to remind people and, and particularly clients when I go to work with them in their space. Yeah. Yelling at yourself right now. It's not really helping us get there. Let's just go do some work. And we dive in and do something. And then people are stunned and amazed that the work actually made it look better for themselves and they're happier with what they are looking at at the other end. And my, my car is full of stuff that I'm taking out that they're releasing and, you know, it, and they actually got somewhere for their three hours of attention. And, you know, when we work together, you're getting six man hours because there's two of us working. Right. And so there's two of us tackling the job and, um, you know, you can make a big dent in three hours and then your brain is tired. <laughs> <laughs> then you get decision fatigue because I'm making you make uh, decisions for three hours straight and you can't really keep it up for hours on end. I just had that conversation with a client too, because I went and we were, she's trying to get out of a house that now has some mold issues and she's trying to select the things that are important enough to her to keep and to properly clean so that she's not transporting mold to her new space. And, um, and the list is pretty short. And of course there were some, you know, I want these specific keepsakes. I want this specific mirror for my mother. I want the, these, these photographs of my family. Those are important. And so she was making this list of the things that we needed to find. And we spent our time going about digging those out. And, and, and we worked on a few other things as we, you know, we were unpacking and looking for things in specific places. I think this mirror is in this room, you know? And so we were unpacking things around to get to the mirror <clears throat> and we did end up doing some decluttering as part of that project and throwing out trash and stuff. And at the end of the three hours, she was like, oh my God, I'm so exhausted. I, you know, like, yeah, like I told you, <laughs> I told you three hours of decluttering and making decisions is tiring. And it isn't that you can't physically keep working. It's that your brain stops being useful after three <laughs> hours because you can't keep up that level of decision-making. Um, for hours on end without um, your brain needing a rest. And so I, I always say, you know, don't go beyond three hours. If you start to feel fatigued at that point, stop and at least take a lunch break. If you have to keep going, you still have to give your brain a rest and you have to stop making decisions and go sit somewhere 
and you know read a book or eat your lunch or watch television or whatever like turn your brain off for a while yeah go outside Mm -hmm. and circle the neighborhood and your brain needs that rest before it can come back and focus again on decision making and so we did our three hours she was exhausted i said i told you so and i went home (laughs) and and to not have a judgment about that right like it's not that you are not working hard enough or you're not um putting enough effort into the project it's that we all have not just you specifically we all have limits beyond which um, making decisions stops starts being counterproductive and so the idea that you have to flog yourself because you didn't put eight hours in it's like yeah there's no point in that because nobody's brain can keep making decisions beyond a certain amount of time like it's just not reasonable to expect that of yourself and so Let's focus on what we can accomplish. Let's let's put in our three hours of time and then let's go take a break and be proud that we did three hours instead of mad that we didn't do 10. Well, and when you push beyond your your own reasonable limit or the limits of anybody who's helping you, yeah, you you really you're moving into self-sabotage because you're going to you're going to bring down your attitude. You're going to bring down the feeling of accomplishment by pushing into now every everything gets harder and harder and harder the decisions get harder the details get muddier and And it's going to be that much harder to get started again on on you know the next time you try it after you've recharged it's going to take longer to recharge 100 percent and she had that experience as well. Like she said to me, I came here and I worked eight hours in this space. And then I went home and I was so exhausted and I had such a reaction to the I mold that I couldn't back. come back for three days, right? Like <laughs> yeah. it took her three yeah. days to physically recover from pushing herself to be there for eight hours. And like, so, so then you lost three days. Like, what was the point of that? So, you know, she tried to push beyond her limits and she was physically able to be there but diminishing returns and then physical reactions to the work and she couldn't come back and keep working for a few days. So didn't get, it didn't gain, you didn't gain anything in the end by pushing yourself to be there for eight hours. And so this is the definition of slow and steady wins the race and, and makes best use of your brain and your decision-making capacity by, you know, not trying to push beyond when you, you get fatigued. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the idea that, you know, it's diminishing returns at that point and you're struggling and it gets just, if you keep trying to make decisions when you're super exhausted and overstretched, then you are making stupid decisions or you're making no decisions. Like the machinery just kind of grinds to a halt <laughs> and then you can't get anything done or it takes a huge amount of effort to get w- one thing done when if you were fresh, and, you know, in a better position, you'd be zip, 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 zip and through. Yeah, she totally had that experience. It's just like the earlier talking about the kitchen. She did it the long, the eight hour way and failed. And then we went back and did it the three hour way and it was better. And so, yeah, sometimes you'd have to have the experience of pushing too far. On the on the subject of um, this comment was in response to the, the suggestion of sitting in a in a calm, orderly space. Oh, right, right, yeah, uh, yeah. Connie, Connie says, "What notices how calm we feel when we arrive at a hotel room?" Yes, right. There's nothing in a hotel room. It's so <laughs> boring and empty, right? the The bathroom has zero in it except the towels and a hair dryer, right? Like, it is, but it's so restful, right? It's so peaceful because it's just. Like there's nothing going on there and you put up your few little toiletries and you put up your few clothes in the closet and the end and that's all. And then somebody comes the next day and takes out the trash and makes the bed for you. Right. <laughs> like, and then you're about, you come back from being out during the day and you come back to a made up bed that you had nothing to do with. And there you go. Like that is the definition of a calm and peaceful space, but it's that way because it has nothing in it. <laughs> That's the bottom line. It just has nothing in it. And so it, it's a great way to remind yourself um, if you can pare it down to something that you can manage easier, it will feel more peaceful. It will feel more restful 
you'll enjoy it better. Good reminder. I wouldn't have thought to put hotel room on the list, but that's having just spent a bunch of time in hotel rooms. That's a perfect example. <laughs> Linda says, <clears throat> having a dishwasher for the first time in 25 years, Ooh. I am determined to rinse and load as I go, and I love the clean sink look too. I've also found as I declutter that I really appreciate the space around the stuff we decided to keep post house fire. It is, it's absolutely essential to cultivate new habits and support our cleaner spaces. Yes, and I know that you've been trying to recover from that fire for a long time, but I love that you know you are putting into the space exactly what you want to have and nothing else. And you're giving yourself the benefit of that negative space that what I think of as white space around your objects so that nothing is overcrowded and everything can still be seen. And isn't that amazing? Isn't that an amazing target to consciously reset for as in your response to having been through this fire and having to rebuild your space? Just love that. You give great examples of, I mean, you, you got decluttered by a fire. <laughs> there is a very definite, you didn't vote for the fire, right? Like it was against your will, but you are um, recovering from it in a very positive and life affirming way, which I think is amazing. And you're setting an excellent example. Lots of people are traumatized by those events and find it very um, difficult to recover from. But I think that, you know, you're, putting a great effort into living with the recovery and a, and looking to benefit yourself and your family from and that process. It's really amazing to hear. Thank you for continuing to share with us pieces of that journey because they're, they're also useful and insightful. Rowan commented, clutter also has valuable information. Often it also tells us what we are actually using and most important, where we are using it and therefore mm. where we need to containerize it. That is exactly right. Because when the scissors are in one place and you always use them in another place, guess what? They always get moved and left in the place where they're getting used. So <laughs> it is a good feedback to get um, from where things are finally getting used. And that's where you need to park them. That's where you need to develop the system around them. Um, and then on to... Acts, acts of kindness. Uh, Susie says, I'm in a 12-step group, group that is going to have a sale in July to raise money. I'm donating Ooh. some items to them. Rowan and says, acts of kindness. Our stuff can be a wonderful act of kindness, concentrating on how much we can easily help others by, by, donate, by donating our extra stuff, even if we don't personally know the persons who will get the stuff. Right. But you know that there's somebody that's going into that Goodwill re resale store or that thrift resale store, or that's a benefit of some kind of a, whatever charity you donate and they provide stuff to people that need it. And it, you have no idea how down the line, somebody's going to be thrilled to have that um, object that you let go of that was just gathering dust in your house and was really unnecessary for you to function. And it's going to be absolutely how somebody else functions on the other end. So giving donations stuff away, giving your things away as donation is a definition of a random act of kindness because you truly don't know who's going to get it on the other end most of the time. And you can just trust that the program is going to link up your discarded things to somebody that needs to have them and do it in a really cost-effective way for the person that's getting them. Even if they're buying them in the Goodwill store, they're not spending a lot of money to get them. And so- right. Well, Rowan added, I'm giving pots and pans to an org organization that helps people moving into housing out of homelessness. There you go. Right. Which is really cool. And they don't and they don't need to be spending what little money they have on uh, furnishing an apartment, furnishing a, ho a housing space. But um, you can provide your excess to do that. And somebody that really needs it can have it. And you can feel good about that. Like it is a random act of kindness that has a direct effect to people. And so... Um, keep that in mind and let that spur you on to release more. Linda shared, I have a list of first, second, third for who I offer the things that I'm decluttering. I oh. never want my, want my stuff to be someone else's burden, but would prefer to bless someone I know with things I no longer need. Last mm -hmm. choice is to a local charity who will also benefit from my decluttering. Mm. As long as the people feel comfortable saying no to you, 
which is part of the I'm going to offer it here and then here and then here. Right. right, and, right. and so as long as they're like, you know, not that one. I like the other thing you gave me, but I don't need this one. As long as they feel comfortable saying no, um, then I think you can feel comfortable that you are directing it to people that you care about and giving them the right of first refusal. And then if they refuse it, then, you know, you move on to the next thing. And so good job. It's a good plan. Bella shared our refrigerator wasn't closed all the way overnight. Freezer Uh-oh. temp was stuck at 11 degrees, therefore had to thaw the fridge for 24 hours. Luckily, we had a fully empty deep freezer in the garage, moved everything there, was happy and proud that everything fit. Currently shopping, in quotation marks, our deep freezer to put things back into fridge. Wonder what I was thinking buying three packs of regular ground beef and three packs of Wagyu ground beef. (laughs) (laughs) I guess you thought you were going to eat a lot of beef, sister. (laughs) Maybe that was it. Or else, uh, you know, somebody's uh, tempted you with a sale. Um, but it's also one of those things that like, you know, it's there now because you had to move everything. Like you, you sort of had a move experience without actually moving and um, that you had to empty the freezer hundred percent. And so now you're very clear what was in there. And so you can plan around using up the stuff that's there and shrink it down to, you know, what you really want is the Wagyu beef <laughs> to be there. Right. So um, get rid of the stuff that uh, use up the stuff that you don't want and uh, you don't want to replenish or replace and get it down to the things that you do want to have in your freezer again. It was just something that created your ability to edit the freezer more thoroughly. M says mm. it's hard to deal with criticism when people say that you have too much are lazy, hoard, whatever. It makes a person want to not change in order to prove that they aren't those things. I know. I know. I know. And why do people think that telling you that you're lazy is going to spur you to somehow going to make you? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why do people assume that? It's just ridiculous. They just want to be complaining. And so, yeah, it's the hardest thing to not listen to that criticism and to make changes for yourself and how you want to live. And so, yeah, tuning out the feedback from other people, super, super hard. And whatever you can do to actively not listen to that stuff um, is worth your effort. And instead, listen to your own conversation about it. Like you're here listening to a conversation about how to declutter and ways that are it, things that get in the, in the way. And like you're pursuing knowledge and information to help you be different, do differently because you want a different goal than how you're living. And so the fact that the goal working towards a better life is inadvertently doing what they suggest that you do, don't let that derail you. <laughs> if if you can improve your life and you are the one that benefits from it, then whatever they think, fine. And if they want to have judgment about that later, fine. If they want to tell you that you did a job, good job, great, or thank God you got it fixed or whatever they're going to say about it on the other end truly the person that matters is you and how you are living and so the people in your life who are careless about the way they insult you you. or or Mm -hmm. demean you demean you about your clutter are going to come with the backhanded compliments too when they see progress and you're going to you're just going to have to let that wash off (laughs) you just fall off you too because these are these are not people who are trying their best to give you what you need which is yeah they're not trying to be supportive generous support yeah yeah they're just they're just being jerks and you know there's no point in supporting that or listening to that and and frankly if there's somebody that's actively saying that to you then you can ask them to please stop saying it to me. I do not wish to hear what you have to say about this topic. And, and if it's somebody that you live with, if it's somebody that, that shares your space, then it can be appropriate for you to have a dialogue with them about how you are trying to address the situation, what kind of changes you're trying to make for yourself about um, how you manage the things and how you want to live in the space. And it's reasonable to explain that to someone and ask them to support you in your movements and in your changes. But if they don't live with you and they they just get to have the judgment because they accidentally saw your space 
or they came over to visit and saw it, or they're just like generally holding on to that belief system about you that you're lazy or that you are a hoarder or whatever they want to claim and name, um, you can refuse that delivery. <laughs> like if they don't live in your house, then they don't deserve any explanations or any discussions about it. And you can just, um, you know, decide that you're not, because you're not supporting me, I'm not willing to talk about this with you. It's a topic that's off the table for us. We need to talk about something else. It's appropriate that if somebody lives with you, that you have different conversations, but if somebody doesn't live with you and they're not in the space with you, then I think their right to comment um, goes right out the window. <laughs> so. Yeah, you can say, thank you, for, thank you for your feedback. We will route it to the complaints department. <laughs> right who will we get will... who will get back with you at an appropriate time <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> exactly that's exactly right i mean because i think that it is one of the things that shuts us down is that the people that love us and care about us give us a bunch of hard time around it it's like that is not helping for you to tell me i'm lazy like why do you think that's going to make it better like that is not positive reinforcement that is not support that is being mean. And so we don't have to listen to it. Like it's hard. I know that it's hard to not listen to it, but I think that in addition to all the things that you're telling yourself right now that are negative and you're trying to reframe, you can reframe. I don't have to listen to his feedback about me. I don't have to listen to her feedback about me. That's their problem. Not my problem. Right. Like mentally separate yourself from Outside feedback is not part of my process. I am not listening to it <laughs> and turn it off. Like, and, and then ask them to stop commenting because it's, it's really not helping. Okay. Um, one more comment I want to share. Na okay. Naomi says, uh, this is in reaction to the not so random acts of kindness suggestion. Naomi says, never pass up a chance to be generous. Exactly. Because uh, none of that is going to make you feel bad later. So being generous is an open hearted thing that is easy to do, or maybe it's hard to do. But if you can do it, um, you are definitely putting goodness out in the world. And that is a great result of doing a decluttering project. Let's talk about next week. Okay. Gail has been traveling quite a bit lately. How many, three trips in six weeks? Something I did like three, that? Or, three, or, yeah, three, uh, three or four or five day trips in a six week period, <laughs> like one every two weeks. Like my suitcase never got put up in between. It was very annoying. So Gail's, Gail's had a fre fresh reminder of some of the, the uh, difficulties of travel. And I am hoping to take a little we're hoping to take a little trip to the beach this summer oh awesome uh a short a short vacation getaway so it seems like time to talk about decluttering for travel how to how to streamline packing and loading the car and planning the trip and all that kind of stuff so join and us then next unpacking week when you come home <laughs> right so so that's next week tuesday june 18th at noon u.s central time i don't mm -hmm. have a title yet but watch your email for announcement of that okay if you're watching this on youtube we would love for you to join us live to get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We'd love to hear from our audience, so please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. Maybe even Instagram one of these days. <laughs> you could always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, I just want to add a final thought here, which is um, the five steps of the tittle, those practices may not feel like a natural thing to do, but that's kind of the point. <laughs> what you're doing right now is it is natural, and we want to try something different. And so spend the time to process the emotions that are attached to your clutter. Work on this daily practice to develop a more positive outlook on your own environment and see if the energy shifts or anything feels different as you continue to work towards your decluttering and organizing goals. And we will be here next week to hear all about it. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.